Hello. Um, so it's third event in three days, but it's lovely to see faces in front of me rather than just a screen. I'm a little bit nervous, to tell the truth. The last two years, I've been uh, staring at the screen and uh, doing conference calls, as many of you have as well. So uh, it's nice. And hopefully, I perform and don't fluff my lines as well. Um, hopefully, I can get the uh, clicker to work. Or maybe it's not going to help me. There we go. Um, so I'm also the last speaker before lunch, and the food looks good, so I'll try and keep it nice and precise and uh, on time. But today, uh, I'm going to talk about procurement's carbon cr crisis, a topic that is deep to my, uh, my passion as we talk to companies around carbon reduction, and uh, I'm sure it affects all of you as you, you look at your businesses, but also your personal lives as well. Um, in terms of resilience, I think we can see sustainability and resilience very much connected. I know that's the topic of today, uh, and let's dig into this. I'm not going to give you amazing slides uh, as the consultancies before have done. I think Sherry's ses uh, session was great, great setup for me in terms of what we're talking about. I'm more into about action and getting stuff done. Um, so hopefully, uh, we'll talk about that. In terms of uh, the crisis in carbon, we're going to talk about some of the context, the challenges, and then some of the conclusions and the way forward. And looking forward to your questions in, in terms of challenging some of my thinking, but also um, where we can expand this as a, as a team. I think Sherry mentioned maybe spending half an hour talking about how we would work together to change things, maybe more effective time than just looking at the slides. So I'm looking forward to your questions. We're obviously in crazy times, whether it's been COVID, the social political problems, the stuff we've got in Ukraine, we're in very disrupted times and that is affecting all your organisations in terms of running your business today but also how that will go forward tomorrow as well. But I have to say the climate crisis is probably the biggest one we see as a, a, a world, a humanity. Um, what we've done over the last 30, 40 years in terms of uh, the greenhouse gases that we've created um, is going to affect us all and at the moment I was asked a question yesterday if we were to do a pre-mortem of 2030. Uh, how do you feel about it and what we've done wrong? I had to swear, I think we fucked it. We're not far enough along the journey. We are now 23% into the decade. So every five weeks is 1% of the decade. It's quite scary. So we can, we can think about things. We can look at a dashboard for a little bit longer. We can look for the most perfect solution of how we're going to start our scope three journey, whether it's in our personal life or our businesses. Every five weeks, we're up since 1% of the decade. Uh, and as companies and as individuals, we need to start making a collective effort to move a little bit more quickly, because I don't think we're moving with enough momentum and pace at the moment. So the pressure's rising on, on organizations. Uh, the scrutiny is coming through. We haven't seen it like, you know, I think, two years ago. We had the CEOs in New York talking about moving on beyond the shareholders in terms of their stakeholders they care about. Um, we're now seeing the ESG agenda come through in terms of the way that companies look at investments, the employees, the customers, and the suppliers. So those stakeholders are important, and we have to make a difference. And the scope three side is huge. If we look at how the organizations now are taking responsibility, it's not just what you're doing in your business. You're not an island within the, the rest of things that are going on. It's your value chain now. You have to look at what you're doing with your suppliers, your customers, the whole circular ad, circularity around your organization. And this is the time to do it. We have to move forward. And I'm pretty sure the topic area is going in your organization. It's on the news. Um, we have to look at this. You know, COP26 was a, a wake-up call. Was it successful? Uh, half glass open, full. Um, yeah, there was a lot of good talk. Did the commitments come through as much as we wanted? Probably not. But did it raise awareness? Did it mean people in the pub talking about it? Did your family talking about it? Yes. We know it's there. We know corporates. We know governments. Individuals have to make a difference. But how do you do that in your own enterprise, your own business today? For those who don't understand the complexity, or, or this is where we see it with our customers, at least in the companies we speak to, about 80% of their greenhouse gases sit outside of their business in scope three. So we can do the low-hanging fruit in our, business, in our business, looking at renewable energy, um, how effective we are in our own uh, kind of operations. With 80% of that in your indirect uh, emissions with your suppliers, it's really 
the place to focus. And I think there's a lot of companies, uh, how they're defining their greenhouse gases, how are they reporting them, they're, they're not really doing enough on the scope three today, and they have to do more. The complexity of scope three is also hard. It's not in your control. It's your suppliers. You have to motivate them. You have to become a customer of choice. You have to take the journey with them. You can't just cull 20, uh, 30 to 40 percent of your suppliers because they're non-compliant in disclosing carbon or haven't hit a certain score because you'll stop your business. And actually, when the next ESG agenda comes on, maybe diversity and something else, you'll be going through the same one. So you'll be slicing your suppliers every time the new, new agenda comes through. So it's about how you take the journey with them. Also, I'll add to that complexity, it's probably not just your first, two, first tier one suppliers that are going to get you to net zero. It's going to be your tier two, your tier three. So you're going to have to work collaboratively through your supply chain, but also across your industry as well. So how do we actually start reducing uh, scope three emissions? Um, I'll talk you through this kind of sequence, and this is what we work with our, our customers on. Um, the first one, rough baseline. I'm not sure the word rough baseline, not perfect, not great data, has been mentioned today, but I'll come back to that one. Prioritizing efforts, uh, seeking alignment, and then collaborating selectively. The big challenge in most organizations is back to that baseline. So many companies are getting bogged down and getting perfection out of their data that they keep staring at it, they can't move forward because they're looking for the perfect scope three. Which supplier particularly is it? Which category? How does it affect our bill of materials? We need that before we can start. We have to start every five weeks, 1% of the decade. I look at my two teenage daughters. I want to show that I've done enough in 2030 that through my own company, but the, what I do today from the book, that I'm making the biggest effort to actually help companies, individuals, for us all to move collectively to reduce that uh, carbon impact that we're looking at. So this is what we hear. We need data to make our data-driven decisions. We just heard about great data-driven data and how it's driving decisions. That's, that's fantastic. But you're not going to get the data on your, your uh, climate change or greenhouse gas, methane, carbon, all straight away. We don't have time to wait for it either. And if you had it, I mean, I kind of think about this a little bit around uh, my weight. I can get on the scales and understand the weight. Uh, I could try and get one of those uh, glucose uh, monitors and then work out which foods have the biggest effect on my insulin levels and then work out what I'm going to eat. I'm pretty sure I shouldn't have so many burgers, not so many beers. I can make effects on it now and we're talking about how you change things and, and move things forward. So we have to make some uh, robust decisions without all that data and we have to start the movement and the change today. And that's what we're seeing with the companies that we're working with and this is the only way forward. You're not going to get perfection of data but you have to start. So we talk about the control the controllables and focus on what you do know. And in most companies, we can understand which group of suppliers within our business have the biggest impact in terms of greenhouse gases. We also will know which categories we really focus on and, and where they are um, in terms of the emissions intensity. And there's a great, um, if you're interested, there's a great uh, two by two by BCG looking at decarbonisation and how you look at the different categories in your organisation. If you're interested in uh, having that, let me know or one of my team that are here. But you know those categories, you know, in, uh, if I'm a, a brewery company or, or, or making wines and distillery, it's going to be the furnaces, all those glass bottles. It takes a huge amount of energy uh, to, to do the glass. In different industries, there'll be different ones. Uh, if you're creating uh, cleaning products, you're going to have plastic in the uh, of the bottle and there's probably more plastic going into the surfactants that are in there, you're going to have to transform that whole category. So working out those transformational categories is not the hardest thing to, to, to know, and you don't need all the data in the world to do it. You're also going to know which spend you have in those categories, how much leverage you have, how much control, and you know the key suppliers to start working with. So there's a lot of data that we do know. Now we need to start using that and moving it forward as well. The other thing is leading and lagging indicators. Again, maybe back to the, the weight analogy and losing weight. The lagging industry of me losing weight is the kilos or the pounds going off. You kind of, it's slow, 
it's retrospective to some degree, and I'll do it every week or every month. Now, there's some great scales that, that do that. The leading metric is probably how long I jump on the peloton and go for a bike ride, the food I'm eating every time. Those are things that I'm doing daily that are going to make a difference and allow me to get my, my health and my weight into the right place. Same thing with carbon. So many people are looking at the carbon reduction, so the kilotons of carbon and greenhouse gases that we're, we're doing. That data comes really infrequently. So it's the activities that we're looking at are going to make a difference. So we need to really focus on those lead metrics. That's the frequency. That's the things that we can see, and that's the predictive to the, the lag, uh, lag success as well. So I'd look at your own business around how you look at carbon and how you look at what you're doing month by month, quarter by quarter, year by year. What are the leading metrics you're looking at? And I'm going to put forward uh, some leading metrics that we're seeing. Uh, and that's, as example, is the live projects with the strategic sustainable suppliers. So what are you doing with those suppliers within those categories that you need to transform? You know, those core categories that you can identify. You can go out there and look today in your business and say, these are the areas that we need to start doing it. Start small. Teams that are motivated. How you, you know, get really around these suppliers and start working with the collaborations. If it's five collaborations, five relationships, five projects you're working with, that's going to get to 500. That's going to get to 5,000 as you actually look at this over a period of time. These are things that you should be looking at. So we're invisible, and where we work with our customers, we talk about these active, collaborative, and valuable relationships. What are those? Um, well, we define them as the characteristics of a successful supply collaboration uh, program. And ultimately, they're relationships that are generating projects, live initiatives, proof of concepts, new opportunities that you're working with the suppliers in a win-win approach. Um, and why they're valuable? Well, each one of those collaborations, hopefully they're aligned to reducing carbon or innovation uh, around those categories or new products that you bring, is an opportunity to deliver against that. You know, hopefully you've got some value trackers against that in terms of what the impact could be around carbon reduction or, or t taking things out of your uh, supply chain as well. And these are the real, real leading indicators as we look at scope three that you should be looking at. We work with some of the largest companies in the world, from FMCG to oil and gas, or, or energy as they are now, um, to pharma, and active relationships, monthly active relationships, monthly collaborative active relationships are the things they're starting to look at, are the leading indicators for change, whether it's innovation or sustainability. So it's really interesting on how companies are are starting to, to, to look at um, change. The challenge here, and we see it too much, is just really looking at the data around there and looking for that perfection. Um, I was on a conference yesterday, I think, with, um, with Thomas Uderson from Bayer talking about how do we get perfection of data. And also, if we look at the PR that's coming out from our organization, sometimes we have a bit of cognitive bias that we already have this in hand, that we've already achieved and we're doing a good thing because the PR engine is saying that we're going to hit our numbers. Reality is we're not going to hit our numbers. It's just not there. We haven't got enough momentum. We haven't got enough collaborations. If you go back to your business and say, all right, how many collaborative relationships have we got working on scope three today? There'll be a lot of scratching our heads probably no understanding of where that data might sit or what the impact would be. And if that is a leading indicator, and I'm get, looking forward to people to challenge me that there's other leading indicators that we should look at around carbon reduction, we're not there. And what we, might, we need to find is how that volume will go. I mean, we've got engineers working on our team. What's your burn down graph to get, from net zero, to get to net zero in terms of the carbon? Where does the momentum come through? Is it really going to come in? And, 2029, 20, 2030, is that when it just ramps from model really going here to a, a straight, crazy exponential graph? I don't think so. I think the things that we do in this half of the, the decade are going to be the key ones that come through. And if you start looking at those leading indicators, uh, the other leading indicators is the alignment with your suppliers. So science-based targets, reporting on CDP, 
So, you know, there's the thing around you're as good as the 10 people you spend the most time with. Well, it's probably your top 200 suppliers that make up about 80% of your greenhouse gas emissions. So, have they set science based targets? Are they reporting on CDP? That's another nice leading indicator that in the next seven and a half years, they're also on the journey to hit their net zero targets as well. But that's not going to remove the carbon from your own value chain. So you need to look at the projects you're doing with your suppliers today, tomorrow, next month, about how you're actually looking at the bill of materials, the products that you're delivering, how you're transforming those categories. Some of the categories will do its own thing. There's lots of decarbonized solutions that you can go after. You just allow the market to go after those. Others, you'll have to do cross-industry collaboration on. But those transformational categories in your organization that the CEO knows about, the organization, how are you going to start working with them today to transform and build them? Otherwise, you're not going to have your products going out there and you're not going to hit your targets. So again, key takeaways. We have to focus on it. That's our the business's priority, it's your priority. I will put it on you as individuals. We have to show in 2030 that we've made the biggest effort to, to try and hit these targets and reduce. Scope 3 is massive. It has to be the topic. If it's not at a procurement supply chain, number one agenda, or one of the top ones there, as well as all the disruption that's going on, we still have to deliver these numbers. And how does that come into people's targets? And you know, the CEO cares about it because the ESG agenda is coming onto the share price. You know, the share price will change if they're not hitting them. The investors are moving to high ESG companies. I only invest in high ESG companies and portfolios. That's where my money goes. That's where your pension funds will be going. Perfection. We can't wait for the perfect data camera or where that scope three and what our baseline data is. Let's get moving. We have to move on those categories, look at those collaborations, look at the portfolio going from 5 to 10 to 20. How do we collaborate, collaborate across the organization? We saw that with Sherry's slides at the beginning about those really mature organizations. It's about the collaboration and the innovation across the organization as well as with the suppliers as well. But we have to learn how to collaborate. Our procurement strategy in the past in terms of savings um, well, we didn't have to collaborate so much across the business and suppliers. We're not going to deliver on our scope three promises and our ESG agenda if we're not collaborating both internally as we look at the, the products and the innovation, the operations that we're running in our business without doing it with the suppliers and not doing cross-functionally. And one of the biggest challenges we have is, and again, I love the solution providers out there, I'm not sure if they're sponsored today, but are the Rebus and Coopers, great. They're going to make you more efficient in saving stuff, because um, spends, you know, spend cubes are great and, and all that, it's good. It's great stuff. You can automate it. We can RPA, RPA out all over the place. We get more savings in, less people in the business, and we're not going to change the scope three. We're not going to deliver against our ESG. We're not going to be set up for the supplier diversity agenda that's coming to us. We're not going to be ready for the fair living wage agenda that's also coming around the door and also the economic impact of where our operations are and how our business affects the world. So we have to change, because this is just one of the first parts of the ESG agenda that we're going to have to tackle as an organization, and where procurement and supply chain can actually step up and take a board role. I think 20 years now, 20 years next year, I've been focused on procurement, supply chain, and sustainability. I've sat in so many round tables. Thousands of people have come and sat, done presentations at procurement leaders' events. I was the editor of the magazine. A lot of people saying, we're going to get on the board. We need to be on the board. Today, sustainability. That's where procurement comes on the board. How do we move, and again, I'll steal from Thomas, from ego systems to ecosystems. Truly collaborative ecosystems that we're working with rather than the ecosystems of your organization and how do you sit within the companies around you. Um, it has to be purpose-led ecosystems, driving innovation, sustainability, um, and that's the future. The companies who have the most purposeful, innovative ecosystems around them, they're going to be the ones that are leading. Now, that could be large incumbents today or the disruptors who understand that's a core part of their operating model in their business. I don't think in the last two years or three years, but if we think about that, that CEO roundtable, I don't think the operating model of most organizations have changed. 
and it's the time for change. We need to get a cross-functional collaboration, we need the ecosystem collaboration, and we have to make the changes to impact uh, the ESG agenda and particularly scope three. So this is the final thought, looking at active relationships as a leading indicator around scope three emissions. And also, I think it signifies the resilience, sustainability and customer choice relationship. So if you think about your organization today, we're all looking to drive sustainable business growth. Yes, profitability, but we have to do that in a sustainable way. And collaborating with our ecosystems, looking at projects and, and collaborations that drive impact, whether that is growth impact or sustainability, is going to be the way that organizations take it forward. And that's it from me. I'm looking for you to challenge. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Mark. Another great session. Great to have you here in person as well, in front of a live audience. Thank you. It's, I'm quite nervous doing face to face. <laughs> okay, I saw a lot of uh, past speakers in the audience for this session, actually, so I am expecting questions from the crowd. Anyone want to start and kick things off with a question? There's a hand up here and one there. Well, take your pick. Microphone of magic. You decide who goes first. We'll come back to you. Thank you. If you can just start by stating your name and where you're from, please. Sure. Uh, Roberto Battistoni from IBM. Thank you, Mark. It was absolutely great. I loved your point about, you know, don't wait for perfection in data because it's not there. You need to start. We are behind. Um, my question is very simple. In your experience, are you seeing only a push effect or also a pull effect? And I'll clarify. I see lots of retailers and organizations, the tier zero, if you like, if you want to call it that way, that are trying to engage more and more with suppliers. Are you seeing suppliers using sustainability, uh, ESG, responsibility as a value proposition to expand their market share and sell better and more to their customers? Yeah, clearly uh, we're seeing it, I think most of the accounts that we work with and coming through, I mean, uh, I met someone outside who, uh, um, a B Corp company. I mean, those companies, uh, whether it's an Ecovada score or a B Corp status, or talking about their UN SDGs that they're working on, it's a key differentiator. Um, now, how does that tailor into a category manager looking at an RFP to a supplier? Well, it's changing. So Vodafone have announced that uh, in their supplier scoring, the sustainability side will be a key part of their selection of new RFPs. So, but we're seeing that. I think. If you look on every single website, every corporate website, every sustainability is at the forefront. So it's into the conversation. I think the companies leaning into it more are definitely going to win more business in the future. Still need to have great products and innovate well, but it's adding the value of their sustainability journey and maybe some of their learnings to those customers they take out there. So it's a key differentiator. There's a, a good friend of mine, uh, Paul, who runs GiveWith. They talk about the social impact side from both the sales and a, and a buy side. Really interesting to see of how they do joint projects. So when you sell something, you can uh, invest money into a social impact pro program, which will take one pound and add value to both businesses as well. So we're seeing that differentiation and some cool technology that can really amplify that as well. Hopefully it answers your question. Okay, great. And if we can get the microphone down to the gentleman here, I'll just ask a question in the meantime that's come in from our virtual audience, and it relates to your uh, point about scope free and the importance of that. Uh, with measurements of scope free still spend based, what are your thoughts on ongoing reduction measurements rather than spending less? We well, have to go for the, the spend is one way of representing what you're you're going. So I spend far too much t time in CDP reports. So. Carbon disclosure, section 12 is, is my favorite thing. That's what puts me to sleep every night and forget about the crazy things that are going on. Uh, in there, all the projects that you're talking about, it will be about the number of relationships that you're working on, the amount of greenhouse gases and the percentage of your spend and how much of your greenhouse gas emissions are linked to it. So it's about the emissions and the spend. Um, and if you look at the narrative, you, you can read the CDP report, um, the active collaborative relationships it goes directly in there. Those are the programs you're doing. It could be about education. It could be about how you reward them financially or their tier two suppliers financially, how you collaborate and innovate with them. Great way to do it. I know if a company's bullshitting because I'll go straight to their section 12, the CDP, 
uh, and look at the last two years and see what's changed in there. If they're not doing anything and not recording that in section 12 of the CDP report, then you know it's all hype. They're not doing anything at all. And that buzz at the bottom is what we're looking at. I'm looking at the buzz at the bottom of our customers. How are we actually collaborating there? How are they creating the narrative that will go into section 12 of the CDP report this year? And how will that be amplified as they put more programs across their value chain? So it's a mixture of the spend. Spend is one way of doing it, but it's, ultimately it will be the lagging uh, indicator of carbon reduction uh, as well. And just out of interest there, you say when you go to a business's uh, section 12 and you do your research, how many of those companies are greenwashing stroke bullshitting as a percentage? Uh, they definitely could. Some companies will say in the, the section above that they uh, have 100% of their data from their suppliers. So in CDB, you can say this is what our scope three is um, and how much of that, is, that data has been given with your suppliers. A few say they've got 100%, which is, is BS. Um, I think most companies are, are doing the CDB and the reporting uh, and being honest, but there is a bit of greenwashing coming through. Section 12 definitely tells you that, that if they're doing something on scope three or not, and that's what you should be looking at your suppliers. If you want a narrative with your big suppliers about, yeah, they've, they've sorted out their, their scope one and two, but their scope three is part of your scope three as well, go to section 12 and start talking to them about that. Look at the 15 different categories of scope three and look over the last few years and see how that's actually reduced and changed. Now, they might have a good reason, actually, that scope three is increased in this particular category because we've been selling more of this. All right, great. Or the other one is this is, this is going up or this is stay, not going anywhere. Well, what are you doing about it? And how do I see that in section 12 uh, next year? Okay, thanks for your patience. Can we take the question from the floor as well? Hi, Mark. Uh, Jan Francis from Visa. Um, I really liked what you were saying about the metrics and the lead versus lag metrics. It'd be great to move to that lead metrics uh, format, but most business leaders recognize the lag format, which is tonnage that we're knocking off our CO2. How do we change that conversation? How do we get our leaders to recognize that the lead metrics are more important? We have to take it to them. Uh, we need to show. So each one of those projects should be aligned with some sort of program um, which is about carbon reduction. Each one of those projects over a period of time should have some proposed impact, carbon reduction, you know, efficiency, the way that will change through. So you might have different uh, value trackers against those projects, but when you look at a program of how you're reducing carbon in a particular category or new innovations coming through, you should be able to report on that. And you know, if you look at Salesforce, Salesforce, there's an opportunity in Salesforce. That's great. Until you sign the contract and get the deal, you're not going to recognize the revenue. That's the drug that you need to sell the business, the portfolio of, of projects and collaborative relationships that come through. That's the momentum that's going to allow you to hit your 2025 target. And with the new standards that came through in, in November, just after COP26, uh, they're looking at your near term and they're looking at your scope three and they're looking at how your what is your strategy to deliver on both of those in near term and long term. So it's a great time to go to your leadership and say, these are the indicators. We're going after this category because it's a transformational category. We, we need this. There's not, not much decarbon. There's no decarbonization alternatives. So we have to transform it for our competitive advantage. We have 25 collaborative relationships we're working on from our current supply chain and 15 more of new suppliers that are coming up with new solutions where we're also investing time as well. So it's the narrative around it. It's showing those indicators, but also it's us getting off our seats and going out there and, and talking to the suppliers. And that's where we become a customer of choice. Why are they going to innovate with you? Why are they going to put their R&D in there? So a lot of companies in you know, Unilever have done a great program in part, Partners with Purposes, their new program, which take over uh, partners to win before. How do you create supplier collaboration programs that are authentic, that get your sustainability agenda, your innovation, your growth, and how do you take the journey with them? If you just rock up to your suppliers and say, hey, go innovate, go in, you know, put your R&D in here, this is what we want. You may or may not be the customer of choice. Also, we need to go out and talk to our suppliers. So again, um, I was with Thomas Uderson from uh, Bayer yesterday. They did a, a great supplier day, a virtual one, and saved thousands and thousands of megatons of carbon, not thousands, hundreds of megatons of carbon by not getting 200 or 500 suppliers to one place in Germany uh, because they didn't have to do the flights. 
but they're articulating from the CEO down um, about the sustainability goals. This is why we're doing it. This is the direction we're going on it. And if you want to be part of our sustainable business growth, keep your revenue, grow with us, then come on our journey as well. So we have to, to sell it to the suppliers. Okay, one final question here at the front, please. Just wait for the microphone, please. If you just say who you are and where you're from. Yeah, Paul Alexander, uh, University of Portsmouth. Um, so, Mark, people keep talking about carbon, which all of us, I'm sure, would agree is critical. Another view is that actually methane is the no, no, term no. opportunity. What, what are your thoughts? No, I completely agree. I just, uh, it's greenhouse gases, I, I say carbon too much. But it's, uh, methane is uh, probably worse than the carbon side, but we don't talk about it so much. I guess it's, uh, it's within particular industries the methane side comes through. Uh, well, that's a nice segue into lunch, isn't it, I suppose? <laughs> Let's go generate some methane. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark Pereira. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.